Welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. Hi, this week we'll be speaking with Rob Norman, a building designer who has created a number of lightweight dwellings in a new sustainable development on the Gold Coast. Obviously we'll also be speaking with Victoria Lee and we'll be answering your questions. But first, we will speak with Craig Riddle, an award-winning sustainable builder who's going to tell us the best tools to assess the carbon in our home. I'm here today with Craig Riddle, he's the owner of Living Green Design Homes. Thanks for being with us, Craig. Thanks, Carl. No problem. Fantastic. So tell us, we're focusing on the carbon neutral home. What experience do you have with, with carbon neutral homes in Australia? I suppose we've been at it um, totally focused on trying to reduce the emissions and striving for carbon neutral for the last seven years. I've been a conventional builder since 1983, so it's been my whole life. Uh, I realised there was too much waste, um, overlap and cost. I originally started back um, in about 2002, I actually just stopped building and went into a research and development phase. When you say overlapping costs, what do you mean by that? Um, in the standard way we're, we're building homes, it's really been separated into too many individual trades. Uh, for an example, uh, while I was pushing them through the, the, just the gyprock trade, you know, a single in the old days a single trade, there was a point um, where it became four trades. So, you know, someone that would sheet, someone that would sand, someone that would do corners. Um, it just everything got separated all the time. Um, so there was lots of overlap. There was lots of waiting for trades. There was lots of uh, transport and emissions being created. I knew it could be simpler, so I just set about trying to find what would be the most pure way to build with just a simple crew, because we had this right about 50 to 70 years ago. And by having a simple crew, how does that uh, eliminate carbon emissions? Okay, um, if it can be in a lightweight construction where you can have minimal wet trades, um, we've now gone on to do some manufacturing in a factory. So you can, you can send out less trucks, less crews, have an assembly type process, finish the built form, and they might walk away in less time. Yeah. Uh, we actually done a study for a small two bedroom home and studied just all our contractors and material supply routes. And I was absolutely blown away, but the, the report that we, uh, we finally come up with the numbers on for this small home, it was only 80 square meters, they had driven 3,600 odd kilometres just to put this home together. That's across Australia. It just doesn't make sense. So during the construction stage of a home, Craig, where, where is the most carbon intensive, um, intensive aspect? Um, look, we've done a lot of research on that and we've proven um, through concrete, steel and transport are the three highest emitters in the construction phase. So what can someone do to eliminate or as much as possible? Yeah, look, that's been our journey. And once we commissioned that report and realised the spikes, well, we set about to eliminate those. So we've ended up with a full lightweight um, option, part manufacturer in a factory where we can control waste and timing and get the details a lot better. But obviously you still need a concrete slab and people to transport the materials, no? Yes and no. You, you don't need a concrete slab in all cases. We certainly have come up with a really well insulated and high performance timber floor. Um, to give you an example for that 80 square metre size two bedroom home that we seem to do a lot of, we're, we're pouring about 2.8 cubic metres of concrete in total. Now that's equivalent to a single garage floor, to give you an idea. So what are some of the key drivers for a carbon neutral home, Craig? Well, lowering your emissions first. Um, look, there, there's only three ways to go about this. Um, use wherever possible naturally based materials. Um, use recyclable materials and use less of them. Recyclable or recycled? Re both recyclable, so whether they have been or, or can be. Um, use less of them is really important. And you know, you've minimised there. Finally, at the end of the day, all we can do is offset our emissions with some carbon offsetting and trying to reduce those emissions. Okay, I think you said previously that achieving a truly um, carbon neutral home is an unrealistic goal. How, what is a realistic goal for, for an um, owner builder? For an owner builder to minimise, um, look, there's no doubt. Can you give us a type of a percentage or a figure? Yeah, 50%. 
fifty percent. Yep. Uh, it's I, I believe there's twenty five percent in reducing the size, and then looking another twenty five percent in the type of materials and what you expect the house to do. So, you know, if we all expect it to be a glass cube and it's fully air conditioned like a glass hotel with water features everywhere, obviously it's just not on. So I think we've got to be realistic in our expectations and it really does depend on what climatic region that you're building in. And I say that because obviously we've got the Snowy Mountains, we've got Darwin, you know, we've got to be realistic on, on what you've got to put in to live comfortably. But I think we need to accept, gee, we can't buy sustainability, so we've got to expect a bit less. Could be in winter we've got to use a jumper a little bit more than maybe we'd like to. But the reality is we're asking the environment to look after us, so it's how much we expect. Okay, and when you say you can't buy sustainability, is that not what paying for offsets is? Absolutely. We're, what we're, we're trying to minimise our footprint, and we're heading in that direction. And I think it's exciting, once people even look at um, paying for offsets, what they'll inevitably do is want to minimise the emissions they're creating to minimise the offsets. So that's a learning curve. Look, we're sitting here talking about the Model T Ford. Give this another 30 to 50 years and you can see what's happened with cars. We're going to get way down this path. For me, I can't see total sustainability, but gee, we're going to get really close. It's exciting. There's, all, there's so many options at the moment. Okay, fantastic. And you, you mentioned earlier that it's good to use um, recyclable materials. Sure. Is that not a bit of a, a catch-22 and when we're talking end of life? Because to recycle a material obviously takes more... High energy, energy consumption, yeah. So again, it's looking at the naturally based materials. And the first one that comes to my mind is plantation pine. Easily to re recycle, it will also break down really easily in landfill, as opposed to concrete and steel. Really high in energy to recycle. So again, a little bit of research, a little bit of thaw thought. Keep it simple. You're on the path. And so, Greg... I guess what tools are available for someone to assess the carbon in their home and to actually do something about it? Look, uh, a quick um, Google search will come up with lots of sites that show individual materials, whether it be timber, concrete, steel, glass. And it's a little bit of, of for, for a one of or an owner builder or someone sort of doing that himself. It is a bit of guesswork. That's why we commissioned a company to study exactly our process, all of our materials with a transport ledger, we wanted to go right, right back through all of the life cycle analysis of every material. And that's extreme because we want to do it in volume for people. But when they, when they research, you can get uh, millijoules per cubic metre or, or, or weight, and they'll be able to do a fairly rough calculation with a little bit of research. But there's lots, lots of sites showing uh, materials um, emissions. So what do you say to someone who says, if you want a sustainable home yep. or a carbon neutral home, you're going to have to pay extra. Um, that they've been misled by um, the builders at large. It's not right. It's just not right. So how would you correct them? I would advise them to really think about it and see if there are other alternatives. We believe we've got some ideas, and I love the adoption from some of our clients and take them. Take them. So, yeah, challenge it. Just challenge it, because it's not right. Craig Riddle, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Victoria, I hear it's all about lighting this week. What we've got this week is the world's smartest light bulb or the world's smartest energy efficient light bulb, or both. Um, it's taken off as a story around the web a bit this week. It can last for 25 years and it's controlled by a smartphone, so either an iPhone or an Android phone. It's 50 to 80 percent more energy efficient than a lot of other light bulbs on the market. Um, invented by an Australian, Phil Bozziot, who uh, a Melbourne gentleman, and um, he put it on kickstarter.com um, with the goal to reach 100,000 US. They reached over a million with over 8,000 pledges, so all pledges have been shut. So why is everybody so excited? Um, it's Wi-Fi enabled. You can use it with either your phone or your iPhone, as I said. It can dim, it changes colours, it strobes. You can program it to switch on and off. It lasts 25 years and most importantly, as I said, energy efficient. So I'm here today with Rob Norman. He's a building designer with Symbiosphere and he's created a number of lightweight, sustainable homes 
with a development on the Gold Coast um, called Eco Village at Currumbin. Thanks for being with us, Rob. No problem. My pleasure. So tell us, Rob, the, the developer of Eco Village has a number of sustainable planning principles to adhere to. Were there any challenges that, that, they, that they brought and how did you overcome them? Oh, OK. Yeah, they, um, they did create some challenges, I suppose. Um, part of it was just around the, the construction industry and the, and, and the builders, I suppose, who were looking to do the work in the village were, uh, had best intentions, but still were not quite up to speed with what was being asked for by those codes. So what, 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 was being, what um, was being asked for, Rob? Uh, OK, it was um, essentially lightweight construction, so basically getting away completely from your traditional slab on ground construction which um, as you probably know most project housing and uh, affordable housing is, is done by so slab on ground is probably a bit more economical on the right types of sites but the eco village has um, a pretty sensitive site and the developers were keen to maintain the minimal impact on that site and so they, they chose to avoid slab on ground uh, a lot of the sites are quite steep so they were also avoiding slab on ground for reasons of cut and fill which can create all sorts of problems geotechnical and environmental um, so it was all lightweight housing so almost going back to the, the olden days of housing in Queensland where everything was elevated and what's, and what's the advantage in, in your experience of uh, designing and building with, with lightweight materials uh, the lightweight materials are just easier to work with uh, you need less things like cranes um, less scaffolding they go up quicker uh, the embodied energy is, is less than if you use mass materials. Um, because in, in this climate anyway, if you're trying to do passive solar design, you tend to want to have thermal mass within the building envelope with insulation on the outside. So uh, to do something like a brick veneer house in this climate is, is not generally a good idea because a brick works brilliantly with thermal mass, but if you put it on the outside of the building, it doesn't actually work very effectively at all. So what I tend to do is have mass either as floor elements or blade walls within the building and then cloud the entire outside as an insulated box which means lightweight timber framing, insulation and then lightweight cladding. So to me lightweight materials are, are the best thing to use in this particular climate. Okay and do the lightweight materials also have uh, an aesthetic appeal? Uh, yeah, yeah I think um, you know really what I'm trying to do with my housing is to blend it into the environment so you know we've got some pretty beautiful bushland settings here, so I tend to just go for um, darker colours, darker finishes, and you know, if you're doing a lightweight material that's being painted, then it's quite simple to, um, to do that. Perfect. Rob Norman, thank you so much for your time. No problem. Okay, thank you. Well, for you asked us this week, we're taking a slightly different tact. Um, we spoke with Tiffany, who was lucky enough to head along to the Grand Design Show in Melbourne. And she spoke with Kevin McLeod, who gave us some great design tips on her, on her new home, which is, she's designing on the outskirts of Adelaide. Um, the home, she's trying to reduce her energy, energy costs and her uh, heating and cooling bills. And Kevin gave us some great ideas, which was using the uh, evaporating air from her swimming pool to cool the house by driving that cool air into the home through louvered windows. It was also a good idea to, to, stack, to stack the home, which is uh, a thermal stacking system, which allows heat to escape through the roof. And I think the best idea from Kevin was using a reverse brick veneer construction, which is a great way to increase the, the thermal rating of a home. Basically, it's brick or concrete um, material on the inner part of the wall with a gap of insulation and then a lightweight cladding on the, on the outer. And some experts say this method can almost halve your energy costs.